We are live for Beyond the Game episode number 21. I got some amazing stuff to talk about in here, like what types of sports cards I'm buying, some things that have happened in my life that I think are really interesting that's really relatable. And if you don't know who I am, hi, my name is Eric Michael. I've sold over five million dollars in sports cards and four years ago i started a coaching program to teach people how to make money with sports cards because it changed my life and i think that's the best way i could possibly provide value in this world and about a year or two ago it took off like a rocket ship we are really good at helping people make an extra few thousand dollars a month on top of their monthly take home so that's who I am, if you're curious. Now, I got some things to talk about, some sports-related, life-related stuff. So I was having a conversation with my dad. So if you don't know anything about me, I'm from northern New Jersey. I am a diehard New York Jets, Mets, Knicks, Rangers fan. I know. I'm 27 years old. I've never seen one of my teams win a championship. It's pretty sad. But big Jets fan. 2018, the Jets drafted Sam Darnold. And my dad is that classic, skeptical, negative New Yorker, just classic. And I was trying to tell him that Sam Darnold was bad on the Jets, okay? But anyone would have been bad on the Jets, especially when Sam Darnold was there. I think they're, who was their coach? Adam Gaze? Was he the coach back then? And they had no weapons. There's not a place to succeed. There's very few quarterbacks that could overcome dysfunction. Like, if the just team's bad. For example, like Andrew Luck. He was able to overcome dysfunction, but he's a rare, rare talent. That's once a decade, maybe. And Andrew Luck couldn't even overcome it because he ended up retiring early. So I tried to explain to my dad that Sam Darnold is now in the Vikings. He got coached by Kyle Shanahan because he was the backup on the Niners last year. They actually have weapons like Jordan Addison, Justin Jefferson, obviously. They play in a dome, which is good for offense. And the biggest part is Kevin O'Connell is an amazing coach, okay? It seems like any quarterback that's under Kevin O'Connell outperforms or outperforms expectation. And I said this to my dad. I was like, there's a decent chance Sam Darnold is much better than he was on the Jets. And my dad said to me, there's no shot. I've seen Sam Darnold play. You can't fix making stupid decisions. There's no way. I said to him, I'm telling you. And my dad was so on this. He, his biggest bet of week one was for the Giants to beat the Vikings. And looking back on it, that was obviously no good. But look what happened. Sam Darnold is, is he the front runner for MVP right now while I'm speaking? Is this going to hold up? I mean, probably not. It's probably not going to hold up, but he's much better than he was on the Jets or the Panthers. Right, Sam Darnold went to two impossible situations to succeed. That's why, in my opinion, with all the rookie quarterbacks this year, I thought it doesn't look like it's going to be right. But my, I thought Bo Nix was going to have the best year because of where he was going. Of Sean Payton, the Broncos have a good home field advantage. But it turns out all the rookies don't look good right now. And if I had a guess, looking at things right now, Michael Penix will probably end up being the best. Good offensive line. Falcons are solid on offense, usually sitting behind Kirk Cousins for a year or two. The point I'm trying to make is coaching matters more than the actual player. I know that's going to sound crazy to say, but coaching and your environment matters much more than how good you actually are. Mark Sanchez, 2010-2011. Two AFC championships in a row. Us Jets fans, forget that. You see the Jets up there? I got that nice helmet. But... Why? Because his defense was best in the league. He had the best offensive line in the league for you Jets fans who are football fans who remember like Alan Fanica, DeBrickashaw Ferguson. Remember though they were they had the best offensive line I've ever seen. Thomas Jones was a good running back. Remember Sean Green from Iowa? And they were loaded. And Dustin Keller, Santonio Holmes, Braylon Edwards, they were loaded all over the place. I could have succeeded there. So your situation, and then obviously Mark Sanchez did not end up succeeding because no one could maintain a team like that. And when it was time for him to get a little bit better, he never did. But that's the point I'm trying to make. Your situation in life and in football matters much more than how good you actually are. And Sam Darnold's situation, it's good. It's no different than high school, right? This is a good example, high school. So high school, you might take geometry or algebra. 
and better teachers or better coaches, teachers, coaches, same thing, they are going to get more of their students to succeed, right? A good teacher will will be able to take someone that is a B student and be able to get make them get an A. That's what a good teacher does. A good coach does the same exact thing. Sam Darnold might be a B quarterback, but Kevin O'Connell is a good coach, and the situation around him is good, and he's able to elevate him to an A. It's funny because off of this, what I'm talking about, one thing I was going to do on here is to check this out. So this is a good one. So um, if you guys have ever Googled my name or Googled Major League Profits, you'll see tons and tons and tons of good reviews. And there's a few bad ones. And there's ones that say something along the lines of Eric's a scam, Eric's a terrible, hu- terrible human being, what he teaches doesn't work, etc. There's a few of them. You should go read them. They're interesting. And I was speaking with my coaches. So the way it works, right, you buy into our program and then you get one-on-one coaching. That's like our highest level program. And I was speaking with our coaches on the people that didn't succeed and who left these bad reviews and why. And it sounds corny. And I hate to like try to, it sounds like I'm making an excuse for why people fail. I always take it upon myself. There's always something I could have done or my coaches could have done better. But it's interesting because my coaches tell me, yeah, I could always see who's going to be a superstar and who's only going to be okay just based on their mindset. People don't understand that mindset is so, so important. It's just so important. And it's crazy because like in the beginning of my program, like the first few videos are all about mindset because it's just so important. And the people with bad mindsets don't watch these because they think they have good mindsets. The people with good mindsets watch the mindset videos because they want to get their mindset better. It's interesting how it works. But I just think that's interesting. And what all what I also think is interesting, and this is a you know, maybe I'll say I'll save this for the end of the podcast. I'm gonna I'm gonna I want you guys' opinion on something, but I'm going to uh, write this down and I'm going to save this for the end of the podcast. Um, but cool. So let's go over some stuff with sports, sports cards, etc. You know who I think is a good buy right now while I'm speaking right now on September 19th, 2024? You know who's an interesting guy who's really good, really exciting, and his hype has died down a lot? Ellie De La Cruz. I think I'm not – this is not financial advice – but I think he's a possible interesting purchase for a few reasons. And the biggest reason is he's obviously an amazing player, number one. Number two, his value has dropped so much. I was looking at his Bowman Chrome base, not autographed, PSA 10 from 2022, his Bowman Chrome. It was all the way up to $75, like $73, $75 when I was looking. Right now, there's low sales of like 38 Pretty wild. And he's had a good season. Just the Reds are like, eh, and his hype has died. I think it's an amazing purchase. I'm actually looking to buy some. If you if you know, let me know. If you have access to any. I was actually, I met a guy off of eBay and we were texting. He has a gold Bowman Chrome PSA 10. He was asking $9,000 for, I think the card's probably... 6,000, but his starting was nine. I'd probably pay up to 6,000, maybe 6,500 if I was in a good mood. But I think he's a pretty interesting buy just because how much of an amazing player he is. And for almost no reason, his hype has died down a lot just because people are focusing their money elsewhere. Otani, Judge, people who are making the playoffs, right? And Warren Buffett once said, be fearful when others are greedy and be greedy when others are fearful. If you just follow that line of advice, that is how to make money in sports cards. When everyone thinks that someone's hot and he's a good buy, that's when you get scared and you sell it. When someone else, when people are all scared of someone, oh, I don't know, his, they're really low right now, that's when you go and buy. Something that's interesting, Alex Hermosi talks about this, or he said this once in a video and it just always stuck with me. Something is only an opportunity when others don't see it as an opportunity. Think about that for a second. Let's take a real life example like Bitcoin and NFTs and all that stuff during the pandemic. NFTs is a really good example. NFTs has died down a lot, par- partially because there's been a lot of scams and stuff. But everybody during the pandemic was like, holy shit, this is 
an amazing opportunity. This is a great way to make money. These things are just going up and up and up and up. It's not an opportunity opportunity anymore. It was an opportunity before the pandemic. And just on a smaller level, like sports cards, the opportunity is when no one sees it as an opportunity. That's when to make money. And it takes some balls. Like it takes some, like Ellie De La Cruz, for example, hit like this gold Bowman Chrome PSA 10 autograph I'm talking about that I'm thinking about buying. This card at its peak during the season was probably like 10 grand. And now it's probably like six, maybe 6,500 if I had to guess. It takes some balls to buy that because what is there to say it won't keep going down. That's why it's ballsy. But taking those types of risks in life or in sports cards is how to get ahead, right? Taking these opportunities that people don't see as opportunities, but you see it as an opportunity. Because once everyone else sees it as an opportunity, it's not. You can go quote that. (laughs) So I think that's interesting. And following along these same lines, so football, okay? All these young quarterbacks are playing not good. And I saw an amazing stat. I think... What was the stat? It was either total touchdowns or passing touchdowns are the lowest in like just forever. There's like 68 passing touchdowns total the first two weeks, something like that. And there's usually around 100 to 110. Partially a lot of new coaches, a lot of young quarterbacks. That's going to make for not a lot of passing touchdowns. And Bryce Young is a good example. So... Right, his stuff went up and up and up before the season. People got excited. And the time to buy Bryce Young was like January, February, when he was playing bad. The Panthers sucked. No one wanted him. His stuff appreciated pretty well. Now, his Silver Prism PSA 10, I looked before doing this, was $255 right before the season started. You know what the last sale was? And it's probably going to keep going down. 98 his stuff has fallen by over and half. Now, once again, this is not financial advice, but that is an opportunity. No one else sees it as an opportunity. No one else has the balls to actually buy it. And I don't even know if I have the balls to buy it, to be honest with you, because that's pretty ballsy. But, for example, the reason why it's such an amazing opportunity is because of the upside. It's fallen a lot. Maybe that silver prism PSA 10 will fall to like 70 bucks, 60 bucks, 80 bucks, something like that. But because everybody's off of him and his hype has obviously died, if he comes back, not saying this is going to happen, I'm actually not that big of a fan of Bryce Young. I don't think he's going to be that good of a quarterback just based on what I see. And the Panthers don't have a lot of weapons. That's just my opinion. But the reason why. It's an amazing opportunity now is because everyone's off of him. So if you buy this Bryce Young card for 90 bucks, a silver prism PSA 10, and he comes back and he does anything, he plays well for one game, throws three touchdowns, 280 yards, beats whoever, there's going to be a lot of hype. That You'll see that $90 card, boom, shoot up to like 130, 140, like that, like so quickly. It's because no one else sees it as an opportunity. So it's very volatile as opposed to Bryce Young in the beginning of the season when that card was $250. There was a lot of hype and the card was inflated. So when something is inflated, he has to play well for it to stay at its value, but so well for it to go up. So the downside is much more than the upside. Hopefully that makes sense. And it took me a long time to understand this in life and in sports cards. So the opportunity is when no one sees it. So you you need a big set of balls. Is basically what I'm saying. And someone asked me, I'm going to get into some Q&A stuff here. So this is like a common question I get, something along these lines. I'm going to answer it. So how do you find the value of a card if there's no sales and you don't know what it's worth? So the way you find a value of a card is like this. Let's say you have a green something of Bryce Young. and You have no idea what it's worth. However... There's a green something, the same card of CJ Stroud, for example. What you do is you compare their base cards. So, like, you might see a Bryce Young Silver Prism PSA 10 be worth $100 and a CJ Stroud Silver Prism PSA 10 worth $800. And now you just determined that CJ Stroud is worth eight times more than Bryce Young. So, just work your way backwards. Find 
whatever that CJ Stroud card was worth and then just do the math. That's all. That's the simple. It's not perfect, but that's the best way to do it. And that's how I get to my values of cards that don't where there's not a lot of comps because especially me, I buy a lot of higher end cards and that Ellie Dela Cruz example, that gold Bowman Chrome I was talking about, there's no sales in the past three, four months. So I think it was the last sale was July. So what I'm doing is I'm looking at Ellie Dela Cruz base Bowman Chrome PSA tens to see how much he's went up or down since that last sale. And then just doing the math. Okay. Because things in sports cards change rapidly as you know, right? Guys go up. Guys go down. So that's how to do it. I get that question all the time. So hopefully that answers for it. Maybe I'll make a video on it. That's actually a good idea. Maybe the next YouTube training I do, I'll make a video on it. Um, but cool. Got some Q&As here. So these are actually comments I pulled from my YouTube and my Instagram. So I made a YouTube video, something along the lines of selling sports cards. And JB Cards asks, what about eBay fees? If I list at 90% of the last sale, what cost do you factor in for eBay? 15% on top of list price? Okay, JB Cards, I think I know what you're asking me. So when I'm talking about selling cards, when I sell cards specifically me, I almost never use eBay. I just use eBay to like bulk dump stuff and send cards to a consigner if I have a bunch of stuff that I can't get rid of or I'm busy or whatever. So when I'm talking about selling stuff at 90% of comps, I'm talking about doing it through social media or Instagram or card shows. Because think about it. If you have a $500 card, 90% of comps would be $450. So you could go on social media and sell that card very, very quickly. As opposed to eBay, even if you sell that card for $500 on eBay, you're only getting about 87%. So you're actually netting less on eBay even if you sell it for more because of the fees. And then also, if you watch the rest of that video, you'll see me talk about the biggest thing is not you know, selling the card and making the money, which is great, of course, but it's one, you get that money quicker because it's way easier to sell something that's, underval that's undervalued because people want to buy stuff at good deals. Obviously, we all do. And number two, the connections you build, right? They say your net work is your net worth. I've been, I, you know, I've been trying to say this all week. Your net work is your net worth your net worth is your network. One of the two. Maybe it's both. But that's the biggest thing. When you do deals with people on social media, card shows, you get their phone numbers. And after a certain period of time, you have people just texting you like, hey, you want this? Hey, you want that? And you can just text people when you sell cards. So it makes your life extremely, extremely easy. Hopefully that makes sense, JB Cards. The accountant says, what Facebook groups do you recommend? Oh, this is also a super common question. So if you just want me to give you the simple basic answer, I forget what it's called, but one of my favorites is it's called Panini Prism something. There's like 30,000 people in there. But a Facebook group is free to join. So you should join all of them. And also on Instagram, you should make an Instagram and follow other people and get your following up, like, comment stuff. But it's not about the group. It's about the card you're buying and the price you have it at. If I go in any Facebook group, 3,000 people in it, 30,000 people in it, 100,000 people in it, a card show, if I have the right card priced at the right price, it will sell. For example, while I'm speaking right now, someone who's really hot is Victor Weminyama. If I bought his cards a few months ago, cheap, got them graded, and for example, let's say a silver prism PSA 10, it's like 1,100 bucks now. If I go and put that card for $9.75 on any Facebook group, it will get bought like that. So it's not really, go join all of them. They're all the same thing. Some are a little bit better than others. Some you might like the people in there more a little bit better than others, but it doesn't matter at the end of the day. It's all the same shit. It's about the card you're buying and you have it at the right price. Hopefully that makes sense. Okay, <laughs> this is a funny one. Johnny Sampson says, hey, Eric, question. I have cards on eBay that are overpriced. <laughs> How long should I have them up there? So you shouldn't because no one's ever going to buy a card from me that's overpriced. So let me change your line of thinking, Johnny. So if you have a card that's worth $500 and you have it on eBay for $600, no one's ever going to buy it unless you're the luckiest guy ever. No one's going to buy it. Sell it for $450, $475. It'll sell very quickly. Cut your losses. It's okay. Take your loss. But now you have money to reinvest 
and I start to do things correctly. And if I was in your shoes, I would watch my YouTube videos. You can learn a lot just from all the YouTube trainings I do on how to start making money buying and selling sports cars. Because by you holding that money, you're actually costing yourself money, right? There's something in life called opportunity cost. And the cost of you holding that money is worth more than you having that money right now. And you can begin to use that money and flip it. The basic, the basic example is that I always talk about. Uh, I say this to my students a lot. If you have a card right now, you buy a Jackson Holiday Bowman Chrome autograph for 200 bucks, and it grades a 10. Now it's worth 500 And let's say it's November. And let's say you have two options. Option A, you could hold this card till February and it'll be worth 600 Or you could sell it right now and it's worth 500 So which one would you rather do? Would you rather wait till February, sell it for 600 or sell it in November for 500 The common answer is, oh, why wouldn't I hold it? Wrong. Opportunity cost. So if you have more than enough money where that $500 doesn't mean anything to you, then hold it, okay? But if you don't, what you should do is sell it right now because you could buy two or three Jackson Holiday cards and flip and do that process over and over again a few times before that card ever goes up to $600. So by, even though you make a little bit more money on the card, that money could have been put in a better place. Hopefully that makes sense. The basic example you'll learn if you ever take micro or macroeconomics is if you have two people or two opportunities, let's say you could shovel a driveway, shovel the snow on a driveway for $100, or shovel the snow on a driveway for $200, and you take the $100 driveway, you're costing yourself $100 because you could have shoveled a driveway for $200. That's what opportunity cost means. And speed is the name of the game, especially when you're flipping things because the more money you have, the more money you could flip, or the more money you could spend, and it goes and goes and it goes. So it's actually not worth it to hold cards a lot of the time for a few more months to make an extra few bucks if it's going to affect your buying power. If you have 50 grand, 100 grand laying around, it doesn't matter, okay, hold it. You might as well. The money's better spent there than being in the bank, right? It's better in a card that'll go up 15, 20% rather than it just sitting in your Chase checking account. But hopefully that makes sense. So that's a very common thing. You'll see me talk about it all the time. Um, it's a common question. So, but yeah, so just sell your cards, Johnny. Ooh, this is a good one. I like the, I like, I like the comments... My favorite thing to do on this podcast, maybe I'm, maybe I'm just fucked up in the head, is like debating with people and going back and forth and being challenged. I love that shit. So this is a good one. So my Kev 777 Yes, I love this stuff. So let me get this straight. A broke 18-year-old male made eighty dollars to $100,000 flipping cards his first year. How does that work considering he was broke? You have to have the funds to buy inventory at that level to flip. This story doesn't pencil. What, what are you leaving out here? Hard work and skill doesn't put money in your account for initial purchase. Aha, yes, I love this stuff. So, my Kev, you're referring to someone. You can actually shoot him a message on Facebook. He actually has a YouTube channel now. His name is Brock Meserich. B-R-O-C-K, Meserich. Sorry, Brock, if you don't want me putting your name out there, but I, I'm assuming you won't care. So, he was the first student to ever join our program. Major League Profits, all the way, way back when. And he was 18 years old, living in Bend, Oregon. And he decided not to go to college. And he was working in a food truck. So my Kev, when I say he was broke, he had a few grand like in cash, like probably three or four grand to work with. He didn't have no money. When I say broke, I mean he had a few grand. And back then, so this is pre-pandemic. So this was like 2019, like right before the pandemic. And back then, it was, you didn't need as much money with sports cards. It was way easier to flip stuff back then. Now you need, you can still get going with three to four grand, but it'll take you, you're not going to make it 80 to 100 grand in the first year. You'll make like 40 to 50 if you're good. But what you could do back then, and things were way easier to make money. So picture this, this is going to sound fucking nuts, but like this is what I used to do and this is what Brock was doing. So when you bought a, bought a card on eBay, there was no sales tax, no sales tax. And what we used to do, we actually used to send cards to Beckett. Beckett was the place to send cards. PSA for modern cards was solid, but they would take too long. And a Beckett 9.5 and a PSA 10 sold around the same. And Beckett, it was way easier to get a 9.5, and the cards came back way quicker. So because of that, 
We used to send our cards on eBay, buy them on eBay, and we would send them straight to Texas. We had a guy in Texas who lived about an hour away from the Beckett facility, and he would take our cards once a week, drive to Dallas, drop all our cards off. You know what the best part? This is going to sound fucking nuts. This is probably going to sound unethical too. Beckett used to have a service called Minimum Grade. And the way it would work is they would grade your card in one day. And if it graded a 9.5, they would charge you $25. So yes, literally, it cost $25 to get a card graded in one day. Our buddy Josh would drop them off in the morning. He'd go and eat some food and relax, and he'd have them back by midday. $25. And if they didn't grade a 9.5, we would tell them, hey, don't touch the card, and they would only charge us $8. Think about how fast you can make money. If you're buying a card on eBay on Tuesday, it's getting to Josh on Thursday, and by Friday, it's graded. Now, the caveat is the margins weren't as high, right? If you buy a card today for 500 bucks and it gets a 10, you want to at least double your money, at least make 500 in profit after everything. We were buying cards for 500 you know, getting them as 9.5s and flipping them for like $700, $800, like trying to make 50% on our money. So not trying to double it. So less money, but it would happen so fast. So that's why Brock was able to make that much money his first year because just it was easier to make. There wasn't as much money in it, but it was easier to make money. And there were way more cards out there to get greater as well, a little bit higher end because people, sports cards wasn't as big as it is today. So, oh, thank you, Jay Mooley. I'm a huge fan of your investment strategies. But Mike, Kev, hopefully that makes sense. Um, so he wasn't broke, and it was just easier to make money back then because that's how it worked. And by the way, if you guys are watching this, and I'm sure there's a bunch of you guys that either see my ads and are like questioning things, and is this guy a scam? I, I don't believe what he said, or like, I think this is wrong. Let me know. Uh, you know, comment, shoot me a DM. I'm always open to be being challenged in a healthy debate. That's uh, I think it's good. I always think it's good. Um, Jim Jones says, do you sell outright or set up auction style or auctions worth it? I sell outright on social media and card shows almost all the time. Unless like I have a bunch of cards I need to get rid of and the season's about to start, then I will send them to consignment and they will auction them. So it's, I always sell outright for the most part, but what if it's just what I prefer? I have students that only auction, have their own eBay stores and auction everything. So it's kind of a personal preference. In my opinion, I think it's easier to build connections, make money selling stuff via social media. That's just my opinion. All right. Bill says, just NFL question. What do you think about the Titans? Like what's their record at the end of the season? Okay, Coffee, when's this, when's this podcast going up? Before Sunday? Okay. Um, so, all right, I'm going to go out and say this then. The Tennessee Titans, this is going to be sound so bad if I'm wrong here because I'm going to get fucking shit on. But the ten- Tennessee Titans are playing the Packers this weekend. I think their record, to answer your question, I don't think they suck as much as people think. I think they could have eight or nine wins. Their defense is really solid, and people give Will Levis shit, and he does do dumb things. Don't get me wrong. I don't think he's as bad as other people would say. But the Tennessee Titans will be the biggest wager I ever make on an NFL game this weekend. If the spread stays around one, one and a half, what it is right now, maybe it's two. I think their defense is going to shut down Malik Willis. Um, I think Will Levis is going to turn it around a little bit. Um, Will Levis to me is here. and Malik Willis is like here. And the Titans have a better defense and they're home and they're 0-2 and the Packers are coming off a huge win with Malik Willis and the Colts came into town. Am I crazy? Or do I? am I the only one that thinks this is the greatest bet of all time? I don't know. I know it's the Titans. I know, I know. But Jesus, I just think it's a great bet. And I'm, I and I gamble, when I gamble on NFL games, I don't do it that often. I gamble a lot of money. So I think it's the greatest bet I've ever seen in a regular season NFL game. But I could be way wrong. Right? We're gambling at the at the end of the day. Um, Joey says, Joey, I see I see your Instagram comment. I'm just mindlessly listening, but you legit just painted the entire visual in my head. 
What visual are you talking about, Joey? I'm not sure. Did I say something inappropriate that I missed? Uh, let me know, Joey. And Jay says, actually met you at Fanatics, and you had some crazy fucking heat at your table, man. And then, Joey, this guy knows sports cards. Thanks. I get someone backing me up. Thanks. I like to think I know a little bit about sports cards. So we have another question. Gory Boggs. You do really well at this. I had a great business selling metal detectors. I was doing about $250,000 a year, but Amazon steadily stole my customers. Now I'm looking for another option. Well, what I would say, Gory, is sports cards is like a thing where it's, you're probably going to make four to five grand a month if you're decent. Not sure if you're going to do a quarter million a year, but I'm assuming you're doing a quarter million dollars a year on Amazon, but your profits at the end of that were not probably like 15 to 20%, I would imagine. And that kind of goes back to like just what I think is the best way to do it. Not like controlling your own income solely is the best way to do things. Like if you're able to learn how to make money buying and selling sports cards or real estate or stocks or whatever, you control your own income. You're not reliant on anybody else. That is the most powerful thing you could do and the safest thing you could do. It's funny because my mom, when I was starting my business, when I was like just like graduating college, fresh out of college, she told me, go take the safe route. Don't be an idiot. You're probably going to fail, blah, 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 blah. And what's interesting is, sure, at first it's not as safe because you might lose some money. It's going to take you a little bit. But once it's said and done and you've been doing it for a few years and now you've developed the skill of whatever it is, digital marketing or sports cards, and once you have a mortgage and kids and a wife and you have bills, having a job, a nine-to-five job, you don't control your own income. That is the least safe thing you could possibly do. As opposed to sports cards or have your, having your own business, at first it's not safe, but long-term, you control your full own destiny and your full own income. That sounds like the safest route to me. So, Gory, I would suggest learning a diff- like either do what you were selling on Amazon, but maybe make a Shopify store so you don't have someone else controlling your own income or get into sports cards. That's what I would say. Matthew says, do you clean your cards before you submit them for grading? Yes, I send my cards to actually one of my friends, and he does it for me. But, yes, I clean the cards before, before grading. Mark says, what is your position regarding PSA versus Beckett? Do you have a preference and why? Thank you so much. So the simple answer with sports cards is PSA. It's always better. However, so we actually just introduced Pokemon into our program, into our highest level program. And I was crunching the numbers and doing the math. Pokemon is interesting because they somewhat frequently get Beckett 10s and black labels. What a black label is with Beckett, it's a perfect grade. So the label is actually black. And I was doing the math and with some cards, so this is going to sound nerdy, but there's something, there's a math equation to be able to to determine what the average amount you'll make with a card or just anything, any type of investment. It's called an expected value. So I took the expected value of, I was like comparing these Pokemon cards and doing the math behind it. And I was like, okay, according to PSA, this Pokemon card, there were 5,000 cards graded and 3,000 out of the 5,000 was a PSA 10. If it grades a PSA 10, on average, I'm going to make $200 in profit. It grades a PSA 10 60% of the time. So my average profit will be around 140 if I submitted this card a million times to Beckett, right? It takes the average. However, what's interesting about Beckett, or excuse me, PSA, that was a PSA example. With Beckett, what you could do is if you send a Pokemon card in for grading and it gets a 9.5, it'll never or rarely ever outsell a PSA 10. But when you factor in that 15 to 20% or 10% might get a Beck at 10 and 2 or 3% might get a black label, it changes everything. Because with these Pokemon cards, you might buy one for 200 bucks, PSA 10 might be 400, but a Beck at 10 is 800 and a black label is 3,000. When you factor that in, a lot of the time with these Pokemon cards, you should actually be sending them to Beckett rather than PSA. Because in the short term, you might make a little less money because most cards will not grade a Beckett, will grade a Beckett 9.5 as opposed to a Beckett 10. But if you send in 20 cards, those three or four Beckett 10s where you're able to outsell a PSA 10 by like triple or quadruple, make up for it. I know that was a lot I just said. Cool. What's up? Oh, Lucas, what's up, man? That's 
Lucas Christopher, reply to my PM today. To be honest with you, I do have someone in my uh, DMs that runs all my messages because I, I get a lot of them. So sorry, Lucas. But I'll, I'll shoot you a message on Facebook, Lucas, and I got your phone number. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> and Sam Asaf said, can anyone tell me something about a community? I have a PSA 10 Bobby Witt Auto. Do I hold it or sell? I would sell it. He's pretty hot. If I had Bobby Witt, I would sell it. It's not something I would hold. So, yeah. And I, I got to end this podcast, but I'll leave this off with one thing. Quick story, and I'm saying this because I want your guys' opinions, okay? I want your opinions on this. So, there was one time I paid a mentor. I met him on Facebook. I met him in a Facebook group, had some conversation. It was good. I paid him. I paid him $30,000 to teach me some like digital marketing stuff. It was a scam. Not that he didn't know anything. He did help me with a few things. But he had a picture in his profile of him holding something called a Two Comma Club Award. And he had the big one. That's called the 10X Award. So what this award does is if you have this award, it shows you've done over $10 million in sales with digital marketing. And that was my selling point. I was like, oh, okay, I'm new to business. This guy has sold $10 million in in sales, whatever it was, I'm going to pay him 30 grand. It's worth it. The picture in his profile was a lie. It was Photoshopped. It wasn't him. He Or it was him, but he Photoshopped the thing like so it looked like he would be holding it. So it was a scam. Now, 30 grand, I still don't regret it. I did learn a few things that has made me much more than 30 grand. He was just a liar and he's a piece of shit. So that to me is a scam. Now, I get all these... You know, I see the comments on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram. This is a scam. Let me challenge you guys with this. I'm going to leave you guys off with this. So all this is, going back to the teacher example, what I do is I have, I've been buying and selling sports cards for a decade. It's made me a lot of money. Hopefully you guys can see that. Hopefully you know that part's not a lie and that part's not a scam. And I have all the information I know laid out via Google Docs, videos, coaches, Zoom calls, all that good stuff. And I give it to people and say, here, here's all the information that I have that has made me a lot of money with sports cards. If you execute on it, you will most likely make money. If you don't do anything, you're not going to make money. And what's interesting, there will be people that join my program, put in no effort, and they don't make any money. Surprisingly, right? You didn't put in any effort. You're not going to make any money. It's not like I'm God here and could just put money into your pocket. I just have the information. That's all I have. I just been got lucky. I started doing it a long time ago and I have the information. Now, what's interesting is when someone fails out of my coaching program, they blame me, right? They might go to trust pilot or leave a bad review or say this is a scam and tell other people. Now, what I think is fascinating about that is take college, for example, right? You ever meet that person that, you know, goes to college, joins a frat, doesn't do his homework, doesn't study, fails out his freshman year. That first year for college may have been 30 grand. So why is it that when someone spends 30 grand for college and they don't do their homework, they drink all the time, they don't study, and they fail out, they blame themselves. But when someone fails out of a coaching program and doesn't make money for X, Y, Z reason, they blame the person who provided the coaching program. Like, would you go to college your freshman year, drink, not study, fail out, and blame one of your professors that you didn't go to class? Interesting thought. The reason, in my opinion, is because college has been embedded into society. This is the thing to do. This is the thing to do. This is the thing to do. And going against the norm is uncomfortable. However, it's easy to blame some random schmuck you saw on the internet that this shit doesn't work. So I'll leave you guys off of that. Let me know. Comment below. Let me know what you think. I'm curious. I'm curious your thoughts. Always, like I said, feel free to comment below. Send me an Instagram. I love I love the messages and the comments and the questions where you're challenging either what I say or that I'm a scam or whatever. I love that shit. So let me know. Hopefully you enjoyed this. If you're watching this on YouTube, thank you for all the people on the Instagram and Facebook Live. Like, comment, subscribe. I'll see you guys in the next one.